I'd like to thank you all on behalf of the Eugene J. McCarthy Center, Healthcare for All Minnesota, Physicians for National Health Program Minnesota, and the Minnesota Nurses Association, I would like to welcome you all to the Healthcare Summit, a panel of experts here at beautiful St. John's University. The League of Women Voters is also here, registering individuals to vote if you are not registered already. Tonight's program is made possible in part by the generosity of the late Dr. Martin Sherber, SJU class of 1942, and his wife, Nurse Rosemarie Sherber of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. The Sherber Endowed Scholarship and Pre-Med Fund at St. John's University has funded scholarships and lectures on medical ethics and addiction at St. John's since 1980. One of the Sherber's sons, Steve, is with us here tonight. Please join me in thanking the Shermer family for all their support. My name is Quinlan Marshall, and I'm a student coordinator in the Eugene J. McCarthy Center at St. John's and a biochemistry major. My interest in healthcare policy began last summer near Lake Dixon, Minnesota, a quaint, serene escape about an hour and a half northeast of Bemidji. As a curious student with aspirations of medical school and beyond, I wanted to be more informed on the sector I would be entering. Therefore, as any curious 18-year-old would do, I picked up a copy of journalist and Harvard-trained medical doctor Elizabeth Rosenthal's Critique of the American Healthcare System and American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back and began a voracious reading that would change my perspective on what it means to be a consumer and eventual practitioner of American medicine. This is an excerpt from the introduction to An American Sickness. Imagine if you paid for an airplane ticket and then got separate and inscrutable bills from the airline, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the flight attendants. <laughs> Yeah. That's how the healthcare market works. In no other industry do prices for a product vary by a factor of 10 depending on where it is purchased, as is the case for bills I've seen for echocardiograms, MRI scans, and blood tests to gauge thyroid function or vitamin D levels. The price of a Prius at a dealership in Princeton, New Jersey is not five times higher is not five times higher than what you would pay for a Prius in Hackensack, and a Prius in New Jersey is not twice as expensive as one in New Mexico. The price of that car at the very same dealer does not depend on your employer, or if you're self-employed or unemployed. Why does it matter for healthcare? Clearly, as with many complex problems in life, there are no simple answers to the healthcare system that Dr. Rosenthal says is in disarray. However, tonight, our distinguished panelists will attempt to diagnose and prescribe solutions that they believe will breathe life into a flawed system. Though the diagnosis is severe, the prognosis is hopeful. <laughs> I had to put a pun in there somewhere, so. To begin, our moderator tonight is Austin Boucher. Austin is a native central Minnesotan and a graduate of Recorey High School in nearby Cold Spring, Minnesota. He is a community activist on a diverse range of issues and was the initial moving force behind this event. You'll hear more about his story later on though. Our first panelist is Senator John Marty. John Marty has been a state senator for over 30 years and is a strong advocate for government ethics, environmental protection, and healthcare reform. John attended St. Olaf College in Northfield and received a BA in Ethics in 1978. After college, he worked as a researcher and a foundation grant administrator. Senator Marty won a major upset victory for State Senate in Roseville in 1986. He first became known statewide for his work in ethics and campaign finance reform. He is the minority lead on the Senate Energy Committee and has been an outspoken leader on environmental protection, renewable energy, and works for aggressive action to address climate change. He is a recipient of the Sierra Club Environmentalist of the Year Award. Wow. 
John is also former chair of the Senate Health Committee and is author of the Minnesota Health Plan, a bold single strategy, single payer, excuse me, health plan that would cover all Minnesotans for all their medical needs, including mental health and chemical dependency. By keeping people healthy and eliminating bureaucratic insurance paperwork and delivering high quality medical health care efficiently, the plan would save Minnesota families, business, and the government billions of dollars every year. The next panelist is Dr. John Nyman. Dr. Nyman is a professor of health economics at the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. His research interests lie mainly in the theory of demand for health insurance the theory and practice of cost-effective analysis and nursing home care policy. Dr. Nyman is the author of over 125 research articles appearing in a wide range of scholarly publications and is also author of the theory of demand for health insurance. He teaches graduate level courses in health economics and cost-effective analysis and has been cited for excellence in teaching on a number of occasions. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our third panelist is Rose. <laughs> Our third panelist this evening is Rose Roach. Ms. Roach is the executive director of the Minnesota Nurses Association and has 28 years of experience in the labor movements of Minnesota and California, having served as the executive director of the Minnesota School Employees Association and field director for the River Delta Field Office of the California School Employees Association. A Minnesota native, Ms. Roach spent 11 years in California working on healthcare policy as the labor co-chair of the California Education Coalition for Healthcare Reform and as co-chair of Single Pair San Joaquin, the regional coalition of the statewide campaign for a healthy California. A passionate advocate and healthcare for healthcare justice Ms. Roach is a national speaker on single-payer health care. She was appointed by Governor Dayton to his Health Care Financing Task Force and recently served as co-chair of the St. Paul City Task Force on Earned, Safe, and Sick Time. In August 2016, Ms. Roach was named one of Minnesota's 100 influential leaders in health care. Our final panelist is Dr. Brian Yablon. Dr. Yablon grew up in Northeast Wisconsin and graduated with a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison before teaching high school math for two years. He then attended Yale School of Medicine, graduating in 2007 and pursued uh, a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. During medical school and residency, he volunteered regularly at student-run free clinics, where he discovered firsthand the shocking inequity and inhumanity of our healthcare system. As a medical resident, he served on the board of Physicians for a National Health Program, Minnesota, from 2010 to 2012, before moving to Anchorage, Alaska, as a CDC Public Health Fellow, subsequently staying in Anchorage for several years before working as a hospitalist at the Alaska Native Medical Center before returning to Minnesota. He now works as an internal medicine and pediatric hospitalist at HCMC in Minneapolis, where he enjoys serving a diverse and largely underserved patient population, as well as teaching medical students and residents. On returning to Minnesota in 2017, he was excited to become re-involved with Physicians for a National Health Program in Minnesota and is currently serving as board president. Without further ado, we will begin the panel discussion. Thank you. Is it Good evening. Well, what? Oh. Perfect. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Eugene McCarthy Center for policy and civic engagement. First off, I would like to thank um, a few distinguished and prominent figures who helped to make this panic panel successful. First, I would like to thank Ann Jones, who is a board member on HCAM, or Healthcare for All Minnesota. Second, I would like to thank 
um, Carol and Ken Englehart, who are board members on uh, PNHP, or Physicians for National Health Program. Jim Reed, who some of you who are students at St. John's um, know him as Professor Reed. Uh, he is the person who did the grunge work, so to speak, in emailing all the panel members for me. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, so much. <laughs> I feel so bad. Oh, my goodness. But um, he is also a candidate running for House District 13A, which is my district. So if you're in that area. And as we heard from Quinlan, where is he? Oh, right there. <laughs> the student volunteer who has been working tirelessly, also attending classes as a pre-med student here at St. John's. So let's give a round of applause for Quinlan. <laughs> East Central Area Labor Council, which is a union um, organization. Jane Conrad is a part of that, my friend, political activist. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, my parents, who have been the commuters, so to speak, bringing me to and from my health care related meetings in the cities. Right, Just a brief bio description about myself. So I was born May 11th, 1995, with a chronic congenital physical anomaly, which is also known as amniotic band syndrome. Doctors um, told my parents, basically, I had six months to live. Well, I proved them all wrong and defied the odds and I will be 23 in three weeks. Yeah! Woo! As I grew up and developed, my parents fought tooth and nail to get medical procedures approved. For instance, we had to boil my catheters for reuse because insurance would not approve an adequate quantity. Um, this made me vulnerable to things like bladder infections, staph infections, yeast infections, etc. If any of you have further questions for me in regards to this, I'm available afterwards for our reception, which will begin at approximately 8 o'clock. So feel free. Um, I would like to pose a couple of questions for you that are meant for the audience to kind of reflect, internalize. You don't have to answer out loud, but I just want you to think about it. Has anyone here gone without health care? Anyone? Has anyone been in debt due to medical bills? Um, with that being said, I hope our panelists enlighten all of you tonight um, and give some uh, other options to our multi-payer system that price gouges people on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, let's get this thing started. Okay, so we have devised six questions for the panelists, and I will be addressing each individual on the panel who we believe can best address each question. Um, and then other, other panelists may chime in when they deem it is appropriate. And then Quinlan is our timekeeper. Okay, first off, doc, um, Dr. John Nyman. How does a single payer healthcare model work? And how does it differ from the way healthcare is organized and paid for under our current system for most working age people? Thank you, Austin. And is this on? It is on. Okay. Uh, and thank you, Quinn, too, uh, for the nice introduction. And thank you, Jim Reed, uh, for uh, inviting me. We've had is, that, is this good? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Is this good? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, anyway, the uh, the question is, what is single payer uh, system? It's a a type of uh, national health insurance, and I, I, I guess I I can 
best explain what it's like by telling you what it's not. Um, and and uh, there is a, a book that was written by T.R. Reid recently that uh, tried to uh, look around the world and try to categorize and make different types of, of uh, national uh, systems uh, and, and look at uh, what were the, uh, the, the types. And he came up with uh, three different uh, types of national systems. One of them is the Bismarckian system, and it's named after who you would expect, uh, Otto von Bismarck, who used uh, the, um, a um, national health insurance system uh, to unify Germany. This was just right after uh, the unification of Germany. But anyway, uh, with that system, uh, it was based on uh, where you worked. And so everybody was mandated to have insurance based on their uh, place of employment. Uh, the employer would pay uh, part of the, <clears throat> part of the uh, cost of the insurance. The other part of the premiums would be paid by the uh, workers themselves. And it was mandated. The, uh, the insurers were private uh, firms, the sickness funds. Uh, and then there was uh, the, um, uh, the clinics and the, the physicians and the hospitals. They, they were all private. So that's the Bismarckian system. The second type of system is the uh, uh, beverage system, and that's, uh, that's named after William Beveridge of the famous uh, Beveridge Report uh, that established the National Health Service in, in, uh, the, uni in the U UK after World War II. And um, th this was a system at the beginning that was just totally socialized medicine. It was paid for by tax revenues, it was, uh, it was a system that was, uh, uh, there were no uh, uh, insurance companies. It was done, uh, paid for by the state, but it was paid for by, uh, it, it was paying uh, physicians and uh, hospitals that were owned and uh, worked for the, the government. So that was, you know, completely socialized medicine. The third type that is the one that we're going to talk about mostly today is this uh, single payer idea. And uh, the best uh, example of that is what happens in, in Canada, although there are other examples. Uh, and that's a system where uh, everything else, everything is private uh, in terms of the um, uh, uh, the providers, you know, there can, can be uh, government uh, uh, or, or public hospitals, but uh, this, the providers are private. There's no insurance companies, and the government pays for people's uh, care uh, out of general tax revenues usually. And um, it's usually fee-for-service sort of a system where you go to the, uh, the doctor and there's a, a fee schedule and the fee schedule tells uh, the doctor and what, what they're going to receive when they provide that service for you. So uh, that's the systems that, uh, 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 that are available. In the United States, we actually have all three of them. Uh, we have the single payer in, in the form of Medicare, Medicare, uh, at least the Medicare originally, the A uh, and B uh, uh, versions, parts of, of it. Uh, we have uh, uh, socialized medicine in, in the uh, VA uh, and the Indian Health Service. Uh, and then we have the Bismarckian system, which is uh, how most people uh, receive health uh, insurance uh, through their employer when they're working at, under age uh, 65. So that's, uh, that's how I would characterize it. Okay. Second question, Dr. Yablin and Rose Roach, do you believe a single payer system would be better than what we have now, than our multi-payer system with a mix of public and private payers? Why or why not? So, uh, you can hear me. <laughs> I can hear me. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I personally believe, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit biased because I, I, I'm the president of PNHP Minnesota, but I do believe that a uh, single payer system would be better um, than the current system that we have now uh, for, for a few reasons. And I can just, I can highlight that just based on my experiences working in, in healthcare, working in a hospital. Um, so when someone is hospitalized, uh, it initiates a big cascade of a lot of different people being involved in different facets of their care, 
figuring out aspects of their care planning, uh, of what's going to happen ultimately when someone is discharged from the hospital. Um, and there, there can be a lot of confusion uh, and chaos sometimes and not understanding what can happen to someone on the basis of who will or won't pay for a particular service, whether that be a drug uh, or a procedure or a rehab stay. Um, and that generates an enormous amount of waste um, and a lot of, um, uh, and basically it doesn't allow people who are taking care of patients to focus on the most important thing, which is taking care of people um, and doing what we think is best. Um, so that's, that's one way that a single payer system um, with a set fee schedule and a set comprehensive benefit set would be far superior to our, to our current system, and I'm happy to elaborate more on that. Hi, everyone. Um, so would it be better? Um, good heavens, yes. Um, <laughs> it, uh, we currently have a system that is incredibly complex and fragmented, and such a system in the end impacts seriously patient health and patient care outcomes. We have, of course, a market-based, profit-driven system, and the reality is, is that type of a system is really never going to provide economies of scale. Um, there are no real incentives that are able to be put into place that are evidence-based and proven cost containment measures that could actually improve care for patients as opposed to improving the bottom line for many who provide no care in this system but profit greatly off of really sick people. Um, when profit is the bottom line, it illegally for a company that operates on a for-profit basis, especially if they trade on Wall Street, they legally have to make a profit. But in healthcare, that becomes very problematic, particularly from the nurse's perspective, because in order to make money in healthcare in that scenario, you, the only way you can do it is to take money in and not pay money out. That means denying care, and that is unacceptable to nurses. Um, because health is not a commodity. It's not a consumable good. We're not consumers of health, we are patients. And um, it really is a public good. It's a human need and therefore access to the care is in the public interest. Um, so the profit motive and the notion that health is a commodity to be bought and sold are not compatible with the goal of making health care accessible to everyone who needs it. Yes. Third question for just Senator Marty. What are some of the obstacles that would have to be overcome to transition from our current system to a single payer one? There's no shortage of obstacles in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> matter of fact, the biggest obstacle we have is people, I'd say a lot of colleagues at the legislature who, well, I really think that's the best way to do it. It's the cheapest way, the healthiest way, everything else, but, but we're not gonna get there. And so it's self-defeatism, cynicism. We can't get there, so why bother? Why waste time on it? Instead of trying to fight for a system that makes sense, well, if it's not politically realistic, we'll fight for something that doesn't make sense because it is politically realistic. I'd argue in many ways that's how the Affordable Care Act came around. President Obama, when he was in Illinois a few years before it, said he thought a single-payer system was the smartest way to get there. Um, but he said at that time you couldn't do it because you needed a Democrat in the White House and a Democrat in Congress. It shouldn't be a partisan issue, but he said, he said that's what you'd need. And five years later, he was in that place and he was in charge of it, but at that time he decided it wasn't realistic. So what are some of these things? I'd say the biggest one is the medical industrial complex, some might call it, but it's an incredible, huge, many aspect things. Many parts of this are very good and valuable. But many parts of it are just getting driven in obscene ways by profit. Um, it's now one-sixth of the economy. Yeah. 17, 18 percent of our U.S. economy is going into health care now. And a lot of people benefit from doing it the way we do it now. Um, if we were to not need insurance companies for delivering health care, which I think I want to have a health care system, not a health insurance system, and under yeah. the Affordable Care Act, when we set up these shopping centers or exchanges to help people shop for health insurance, I think we should be putting our effort into helping people pick which doctors and clinics and so on and help them access the care they get. But if you're going to get rid of insurance companies, 
well, then some people are going to lose jobs. And that's a very real concern and a very real obligation to somebody putting in place a replacement, that we have to do something to retrain and provide dislocated worker benefits to people who are displaced from their jobs. I think that's a moral obligation of people putting in a system, and that's why we would propose to do that. But so you have some changes, and any change in the economy is going to have status quo, is going to have more pressure that way. And on top of that, the reason it becomes so difficult is some of the folks that make the most profits from the system have a big reason, financial reason, to defend the system, and they spend a fortune lobbying at the federal level, the state level, trying to keep what they've got. Um, Rose Roach just showed us before the panel about, what was it, United Health Group? Um, 35% increase in profits for the first quarter of this year. Oops, it went blank, but it was 35 35% profit hike in last year's first quarter, 30% jump in the first three months of 2018. It's the nation's largest health insurer, added more than 2 million customers, improved its business outside of insurance as well. Um, they have a huge reason for doing this, and they spend a fortune trying to raise fear of what we don't have, and um, they will be told, you know, we're going to have socialized medicine. You know, this is, as Dr. Nyman pointed out, this is not a socialized medicine. This is a Medicare-type model, socialized system where, like the VA, where everybody's a government employee. I think whenever people ask that, I say, well, what's, what's the concern about it? Socialized, you know, do you know our military is socialized? They're all government employees. I mean, public libraries are socialized. Our police departments are socialized. But this isn't socialized. This would have private sector hospitals. Most would be private. Most doctors and others. You'd have public health nurses. School nurses are public health nurses. But um, they raise fear of that because people are afraid of the term and they're afraid what it might mean. There's another concern people are going to lose care. They're going to have health care rationed for them or something, which I would argue is not the case. Right now, we actually do ration care, sometimes through government, sometimes mainly through insurance companies. But they, they're afraid this is going to take away something from me. And the third one is sometimes it's envy. I don't want somebody else getting something that I don't have. And when people are struggling to pay for health care, they're very worried somebody else might get something for free that they're not getting. And um, again, the other final concern I'll say is because healthcare is so expensive, if we can't afford it now and you're saying we're going to cover everybody, 100% of the public, Minnesota we're up to like 95%, but you're going to cover 100% of the public, that's more expensive. And not only are you going to cover more people, you're going to cover more things. You're going to include dental care, nursing home care, mental health care, and prescription drugs. You're going to cover all those things. How are we going to pay for it? And my point is a logical health care system is actually cheaper. We've spent 40 years trying to make sure people don't overuse health care because it's so expensive. And after four decades of that, I think we've been fairly successful. We don't overuse health care compared to other countries. They go to the doctor in many cases much more than we do and so on. But we're still spending twice what any other country spends in health care. So maybe it's time to look at a new model. But, but those fear tactics, the a lot of money out there saying these are all problems that are going to happen. Um, I hope during the rest of the evening we can get into why each of those things is not true, but the reality is there's a lot of fear out there and a huge medical industrial complex who's out there with big money. Um, there are lots of members of Congress who get uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars from medical uh, insurance and providers and pharmaceutical industry and so on. and. Um, one of you mentioned Medicare Part D, I think, the prescription drug model. Um, the federal government, Congress banned the federal government from negotiating prices when that took effect, um, which is bizarre. We're basically telling pharmaceutical industry, for seniors, we're going to buy whatever they need. You tell us how much to pay you. How did they get that? Well, Billy Towson, the Louisiana congressman who was in charge of the committee that wrote the bill, um, he thought that was a pretty good idea, and the week after that bill passed, he became the executive director of Pharma at a salary of over a million dollars a year, and you can see how the big money has an impact on politics. Quick plug, his book is Healing Healthcare, the case for a common sense universal health system. You don't need a high school diploma to read it. It's very good, I read it in two nights. Anyways. Question numero cuatro. 
Senator Marty and Yablin, do you think a single payer model can be done on a state by state basis or should it be done nationally? Dr. Nyman, comments? So um, it can be done on either a state by state basis or on a national basis. Uh, the Canadian, initially in Canada, um, my understanding is that Saskatchewan was the first province that went to a single payer model and that other provinces then quickly followed suit. Um, and that there's some level of provincial control uh, within Canada for, for different health services. Um, so within the US, the best economy of scale would be to do it nationally, um, and that would make the most sense um, in terms of simplification <laughs> of finances. But there's definitely enough people um, in a state like Minnesota, especially a state like Minnesota with a diverse economy, um, and not a lot of out-migration of people who get health care in other states where it would make sense to do it on a state basis as well, uh, and maybe easier politically. And I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, I, I think you could do it either the state or national level. If I had, if I could just call the shots and say, okay, let's implement a, a single payer a universal health care system nationally or in Minnesota, I'd pick nationally. One, because you help everybody, not just help one state. And number two is, Dr. Yablon said, it's um, you get better efficiencies of scale. Um, there are a lot of countries that have universal health care systems that have less than five and a half million people, which Minnesota does. You could do it either way. I'd argue you ought to fight for it in both cases because the obstacles are so great. You take the victories where you can, and frankly, at the federal level right now, um, things are kind of messed up, and I think we have a better chance in one of the states and perhaps Minnesota. So I think you fight at both places, but it definitely could be done at the state level, and um, our Minnesota health plan proposal would propose to do that. Okay, then question number five. Senator Marty and Rose Roach, what are some of the objections to a single payer model that have been raised, and how would you respond to them? Well, um, the senator and I came up with a, a few, and I'll take the first couple ones. Uh, so a lot of times we hear, if healthcare is free, uh, won't people overuse it? So first of all, we're not talking about healthcare being free, right? That's not the case with the Minnesota Health Plan, nor is it the case with either of the uh, Medicare for All type bills that are on, um, in both the House and the Senate nationally. Um, Health care dollars are simply allocated towards actual care, and everyone pays into the system based on their ability to do so. Um, Senator Marty had mentioned overuse versus underuse of care. There is, uh, there is no evidence in this country that says we are overusing health care. Um, I don't know anybody who's taken a vacation day and deciding one of those days they're just going to run in and get a colonoscopy quick fast. <laughs> I mean, it's just absurd on its face. It does not, yeah. it, do, it doesn't work that way, right? It's, again, it just does not work that way or checks yeah. themselves into the hospital for the heck of it, you know? Um, we I'm see like care because, <laughs> I'm actually not a nurse, by the way. I'm a trade unionist and I'm just lucky enough to work for nurses and help them with uh, policy uh, issues versus the clinical work. But um, uh, you know, we go to the, a doctor or to a hospital because we're sick, right? Or we're injured. That's why. Uh, other countries have healthcare systems based on medical need, uh, not uh, and not for profit or cost. That's borne by patients, and not and not in any of those countries do they show that individuals are overusing the care. Um, they do show that individuals, because the cost barrier has been removed, can go to the doctor when they're sick instead of having to wait it out or use Google, right, to diagnose and treat them, um, only to have that, you know, that illness actually misdiagnosed and it creates a bigger health issue in the long run. Nurses tell me on a regular basis that the patients they are seeing these days are much, much sicker than they have ever, ever been before because Americans are constantly delaying care and that is due to cost. I'll share one story that um, the president of our union talks about often. She's an ICU nurse in, in, uh, at North Memorial Hospital in the Twin Cities area in Robbinsdale. And she one weekend had two gentlemen in the, in, in the ICU beds, both of them intubated, and they both were diabetics. And one of them uh, was, it, after he was not intubated any longer, he, she asked him, why are you here? You're a diabetic, what's going on? You didn't take your insulin, that's the reason you're here. And his reason was because he simply couldn't afford his insulin. 
and that threw him into a diabetic coma, et cetera. Then the second one said also trouble with insulin purchase, but the issue was that his son was a diabetic and he couldn't afford the insulin for both of them, so he split the insulin between himself and his son. Um, now, I don't know for sure I hear insulin is running somewhere around $700 a month, which is a whole other conversation around you know, cost of pharmaceuticals, but the point being it costs $15,000 a day for each of them to be in the ICU over the weekend, right? We're penny wise and pound foolish in this country in the way that we spend healthcare dollars. Um, and then I would simply say that um, the, uh, one of the other things we hear a lot is people won't take any responsibility for their health. If healthcare is available so easily, they won't exercise, they won't eat right, they'll smoke, they'll gain weight, right? And then all the rest of us are gonna end up paying for that. Well, can we do better as a society on some of those issues and taking care of our health? Absolutely we can. Are the major cost drivers? In this current system, due to lifestyle choices such as smoking and alcohol consumption? No, they're not. Um, according to the industry, however, and I sit in the room plenty with the industry, they will tell you basically we're old, we're fat, and we're expensive. Right? That it's our fault. Blame us. It's our fault because we're using health care. How dare we? Right? That's what we get from them all the time. If we just ate more fruit you know, and walked our 10,000 steps or whatever, everything would be fine. But in other countries, other than obesity, and child obesity is certainly an issue that is a serious one here in the United States, but I will tell you that that's a broader conversation we need to have in this country around social determinants of health because we don't ever have that conversation. We just want to talk about the bad behavior or the this or the that or the high cholesterol levels or the whatever. We don't talk about in neighborhoods of poverty, go try to find a farmer's market with fresh fruit and vegetables. But you can go down to a Taco Bell or a McDonald's and feed your child for 99 cents with a burger as opposed to 6.99 for a salad. Right? I mean, there's lots that goes into this beyond what happens in the exchange between me and the doctor in the 10, 20 minutes we spend together, right? Um, and the other country, industrialized nations in this world take that into consideration. They think about the social determinants of health, um, joblessness, non-livable wages, poverty, public transportation. Those things impact our health. Um, so uh, the idea that you know we're just trying to sabotage our own health is really there's no evidence to support that and it's kind of ridiculous. I'm not sure why we want to. And the last thing I'll say is just in case you want to know a little more about what I'm talking about, everybody heard of wellness programs, right? They get promoted big time, right? Wellness programs? Yeah. So that's a, about a six billion dollar industry and there's very little evidence that they have done anything to improve long-term health outcomes. But even if they saved us a billion dollars, they still charged us five billion to do this. These cottage industries that pop up are not necessarily about patient health outcome as much as they are about generating the precious dollar. When Austin gave us the these, he gave us the questions in advance. That's unfair, but he did give us the questions in advance. I'm rigging it, John. I, I kind of. <laughs> what can I say? Kind of like it when they just come randomly, so we yeah. keeps you thinking. But that's next. Yes. But when um, Rose and I got these questions, uh, I just realized when Rose was talking about how if healthcare is free, won't people overuse it? We never explained how we would pay for this. And I'll just give real briefly, like in the Minnesota Health Plan, our version of what we're hoping for the state level, people would all be paying premiums, but instead of premiums based on how old you are, or how sick you are, which usually is inversely related to your ability to pay. The sicker you are, usually the higher your medical bills, obviously, and your ability to pay is much less. But under ours, we'd have premiums that are based on ability to pay kind of like income taxes, you pay more if you make more and so on, so it'd be that kind of a system, but it'd be affordable to everyone, everybody would pay into it and so on, and your premiums that you'd pay to Minnesota Health Plan instead of paying to your employer or Blue Cross or whatever, um, would cover everything. You wouldn't be paying separately for the dentist because that's not covered. You wouldn't be paying co-pays or deductibles for everything you do, you'd be paying your premiums along the way, and so healthcare at the point of service doesn't cost you anything which gets into 
one of the other concerns that when people, what are the objections people raise? One of them is going to be, I think I mentioned earlier, what about fear of rationing health care? Because you know government is going to ration health care. And I push against that very heavily because I don't, you know, if somebody's got to ration health care, who should do it? I really, really don't like who does it now. The insurance company's doing it. I really, really don't want the government doing it. Well, who should ration it then? And I keep thinking maybe the logical people to do it would be patients and their doctors. Oh, they all want the Cadillac treatment. They all want the most expensive stuff. And as Rose mentioned, yeah, people don't say, you know, I'd like a new knee because it's so much, I want a technological <laughs> knee. That's pretty painful stuff. And most people don't try and get extra stuff. And doctors, they take an oath to provide good care and be looking out for their patient's best interest. Not doing, oh, let's see how many more procedures we can do to somebody. <laughs> That's not saying there aren't problems with the system and people might abuse certain things and so on. But the bottom line is who should ration care? Patients and their doctors. In Gunderson Healthcare in La Crosse, Wisconsin, I think it is, a uh, healthcare system there, about 10, 15 years ago, they started working very aggressively to have older folks and everybody come in and, and write advanced directives where you tell them if you become incapacitated, what kind of care you want. If you are terminally ill and in pain, do you want them to resuscitate you if your heart stops and so on. And they went through this process and so on because it's a better, more humane way for people to tell providers what kind of care they want. And the thing they found out was it was actually a lot, of, a lot cheaper because people don't want intensive care when they're dying in some cases, but people should be able to choose that. And that's my point. If you have a doctor, I've had two lower back surgeries, it's no fun. Um, first time I was told I had to get one, I went for a second opinion and that time, oh, you got plenty of other things you can do first. And a few, plenty of other things later, I ended up with surgery anyway. But, but, but the point was, when you know you got a less painful thing to do, a simpler, a less expensive, everything else, even if you're not paying the bills, there are many times when my doctors say, oh, either of these things are covered. I mean, it's all, I got a pretty good plan, and uh, so is it covered either way. Well, I want the simpler, easier, and if all things are equal, I'm going to pick the cheaper one, too, even if I'm not paying the bills. And is somebody going to abuse that? But bottom line is, who should ration care? patients and their doctors, our bill would prohibit the health plan from rationing care. The other rationale I'll, I'll say the people object to, they say, well, we need health insurance companies. They're care managers. They manage your care. Matter of fact, we call HMOs managed care organizations. And my point is that's, that's a misnomer. They're not managing care. They're managing claims payments. If you look at what Aetna out in California just went through, they're in a lot of heat now because a former doctor there who was one of their um, medical advisors who was the one who signed off on whether people should get the prior authorization. The doctor has to call the insurance company to find out if they can get a certain treatment. When the doctors testified in a court case that, oh yeah, in his 10 years or whatever, seven years at Aetna, never once did he look at a patient's actual me medical record before denying care. Oh, others looked at that and I just signed off on it. When you have an insurance company doing it, if the doctor's not even looking at your record and telling you you don't need the case, uh, that's a problem. So doctors weren't, uh, insurance companies weren't managing care. Frankly, the people who should manage care are medical providers, your clinic. I, I don't need a lot of care managed, but I need somebody to remind me when to get my tetanus shot every 10 years. I need things like that. Some people with complex conditions, people with severe mental illness may need a lot of management of their care. But the bottom line is insurance companies are not managing care. They're managing their claims payments so they can be more profitable. Austin, I didn't get a chance to comment on the last time, so I'm going to comment now, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, uh, for Do whatever you want. That really, uh, the largest uh, uh, barrier that we have now is that w we all exist, and we all know whether we're right now healthy or uh, sick, where we know whether we're rich or poor. And uh, what a lot of the uh, barrier to me uh, is from people that have known that uh, now they're, they're healthy and, and rich and they don't want to pay for the care for the, the uh, poor and the, and the sick. And, uh, and, you know, unless they have, you know, the uh, sort of ethical uh, uh, idea of, of uh, altruism, 
uh, they're going to want to, uh, you know, they'll think it's unfair. I think the way that uh, you, you should think about it is that uh, uh, through John Rawls, who's a, a social uh, uh, ethicist, uh, is thinking about being behind a uh, veil of ignorance, where we're, we're trying to think about uh, what we would like to have in a system where we don't know where we're, whether we're going to be sick or we're going to be healthy. We don't know where they're going to be rich or we're going to be poor. So it's social insurance. So everybody has the same chance of being uh, sick and everybody has the chance, same chance of being uh, uh, healthy and poor and, and uh, rich. And so uh, under those circumstances, then everybody, uh, then it's fair because you don't know where, where you're going to be. It's not like uh, you're trying to impose a system now where people actually know where they're going to be, where they are, and uh, for some people, they think it's unfair. Okay, final question. Um, Dr. Yablin and Rose Roach, what else do you think our listeners should know about our current healthcare system, and how can it be improved for all? I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit on what um, Dr. Nyman just said. Um, so the veil of ignorance is something that, um, it's not just something that you can pull over as a, as a hypothetical. I mean, none of us actually know what's going to happen with our health or with our family member's health. And um, no matter how healthy your habits are, um, something very, you know, uh, something bad could happen. You could, you could get cancer, you could get a neurodegenerative illness. And this has happened, I'm sure, to people in this room and to your family members, and it's happened to my family members. And so um, that's why that this, and in that moment, um, or if there's an emergency, you can't make a fully informed, cost-conscious decision about your health care. It just, it is not that type of a, a product um, or good. And that, and that, I think, is why, what most of us recognize, why it is something that should be a social insurance and something that we should guarantee to everyone because it is generally considered to be a right of all people. Um, and not, that's not the way we're treating it right now. Um, I think something that we haven't really touched on is that in Minnesota um, today, 6% of the state population does not have any health insurance. 4% um, of children in Minnesota do not have health insurance. Um, and you could say that's, that doesn't sound like a very high percentage of people, but that's 350,000 Minnesotans, give or take, that don't have any health insurance at all. It's a lot of people. Um, and even if you have insurance, one in three people who have health insurance nationally uh, report that they self-ration their care. So I don't want the government rationing care. Um, I don't want an insurance company rationing care. And But people themselves are rationing their care because they incur out-of-pocket costs um, when they have to pay for a, a doctor's visit, when they have to pay payments for drugs. Uh, one in three people self-ration and don't go to the dentist um, when they have a dental problem because they don't have dental insurance or can't pay uh, for the dental care. Um, and this predominantly, uh, this preferentially and has worse impacts on people who have fewer resources, on poor people, on people in rural areas, on uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, and so our current system worsens health disparities, it leaves people marginalized, and it kicks you while you're down. Um, and it's a completely unjust system, uh, which is why I support a single payer system. Um, I would add to that, uh, you know, one of the things we haven't really touched on is um, medical debt and bankruptcy. Um, you know, medical debt is a leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States, and we happen to be the only industrialized nation in the world where people can go bankrupt for being sick. Um, nearly one in five Americans have delinquent medical debt on their credit reports. That includes 1.2 million people in, for instance, the Chicago area who owe nearly a billion dollars, um, according to a data that was compiled by Mike Antico of Rest in Peace Medical Debt. Um, last year, I'm very proud to let you know, in case you don't know, that the Minnesota Nurses Association purchased $2.5 million of medical debt for 1,800 families in the state of Minnesota, and we relieved all of that debt. We heard these horrible stories of patients who had a surgery and had these five ten thousand dollar deductibles and they couldn't go back to get the physical therapy that they would need after the surgery and they were in continued pain and now because that debt is gone they are able to go back and receive the care that they actually need. Um, I would just say from, because uh, I was asked to speak a little bit even though I'm not a nurse myself, um, from the nurse's perspective and I guess I want to say that nurses understand really all too well that what it means when 
the ability to provide care is impeded by a system where health insurance companies dictate their, the care that they're able to provide, it becomes very, very frustrating because nurses are focused on you as the patient. They simply want to help you get well. We can't keep pretending that we will figure out a way to make private insurance markets work for everyone when it comes to health care. We've been there, we've done that for well over half a century, and guess what? It's not working. Um, the nurses say half a century is enough. It's time to stop worrying about making markets work for insurers at the cost of patients. Um, and your nurses want you to know that they really want you to have health care, and they're fighting every day to make it so. They take their advocacy beyond the bedside and into the community and, the, and into the halls of Congress. And one other quick story, we were lobbying on this issue nationally in D.C., and we were lobbying a Democratic congressman who um, turned to us and said, you nurses need to lower your expectations on this. Um, well, you don't ever underestimate nurses <laughs> when it comes to issues like this, because one of the nurses looked him dead in the eye and said, you want me to say that the next time I prep you for surgery? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just want to be really clear that, you know, the nurses are really leading in the healthcare justice uh, portion of the overall justice movement and very, very proud to do so. Yeah. I just want to say that I was, I had the privilege and opportunity to meet with and take a selfie with the president of the Nurses Association in Minnesota and she said that she refers to Rose as do the rest of the nurses in the organization as the Energizer Bunny because <laughs> she keeps on going. Okay, so now we'll move on to our last a little segment in our forum with the question and answers from the audience. First question, and it sounds like it's directed towards John Marty. What would it take politically and practically in Minnesota to make it possible for all Minnesotans to buy into Minnesota care? Uh, good question. Um, there's a proposal the governor has to allow any Minnesotan to buy into Minnesota care, which would really help for, again, about two-thirds of Minnesotans get their health care through their employer. But for the one-third who, well, it's less than a third because a lot of people get covered through medical assistance, which is Medicaid or other things like, or Minnesota care for low-income workers and Medicare and VA and so on. But above the, about 5% of Minnesotans buy their insurance on the individual market. And Governor Dayton has suggested, why don't we allow them to pay the, the cost that they would, their share of the cost, actuarial cost of their care to Minnesota care. I think it's a good idea. I don't think it fixes the problem, but for that 5% of the market, a lot of counties, they were, we were worried that some counties wouldn't have a single plan that people could even buy if they could afford it. Um, and so Minnesota care would be an option for people. It wouldn't be hard. The legislature could do it. The governor, the proposal costs like $13 million one time to set up the administrative functions of it. And then the people buying it would be paying their own premiums. I think that's a big step forward for now. It doesn't move us towards this, but it helps. One of the things I'd say is in looking for a solution to a problem like we'd suggest Minnesota Health Plan is, when you're looking for a solution, it doesn't mean until you get it, you don't try and do anything to make things better. You're trying to help. If there are a thousand little things that might make life better for some people, you do them. At the same time, you keep fighting for a fix to the solution. So a buy into Minnesota care would be a helpful thing. And um, the legislature, there's legislation to do it. The governor was unable to get a hearing on his bill this year. And so it's not likely to happen. But um, it would certainly help for people right now who are struggling to find affordable insurance. Okay. Next question. What is single payer pay, what is that? Flat rates um, statewide. Would specialist centers like the Mayo receive higher payouts for more experienced doctors? And this is where Yablin. <laughs> Well, as, as I understand the Minnesota Health Plan, um, it, it establishes a health board, and that board would negotiate with, with different hospitals rates that get paid on a 
typically on a fee for service basis. Um, so it doesn't include any, it doesn't say just in the, in the legislation, you get paid X, Y, or Z. So it would be individual rate negotiations, presumably based on trying to constrain those, um, those costs within a much tighter band than we currently have. Um, where people were talking about you know, a tenfold range in procedures. I think that the board would try not to make sure that didn't happen um, and would pay attention to things like, um, like the actual cost of care and quality of care. And I, I would definitely like John Marty to expand on this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will expand yeah. on it for a second. And, and I like what Dr. Yablon said, because Quinlan was earlier talking about a book that's worth reading. I didn't hear about it till last year, but Elizabeth Rosenthal, who's a doctor, head of Kaiser Health News right now, I think. Big, thick book, so if you want a short read, it's not the one to do, but, but it was very helpful, and she talks of 10 to 1 price disparities. There was actually studies showing 16 to 1 price disparities um, for a certain type of knee surgery across the country, various hospitals. And the cheap hospitals there weren't losing money doing the procedure. They were doing it for like $3,500, the most expensive one, $55,000, 16 to 1 price disparity. Um, and um, basically a negotiated thing where you negotiate with nurses, you negotiate with doctors, you negotiate with hospitals, you negotiate the rates. Um, one thing we explicitly say in the legislation directing the health plan board would be that you have to ensure that there are enough providers in the community. That would be a legally binding obligation which means in a small town in Thief River Falls, north of Thief River Falls in the northwest corner of Minnesota, you might have to pay more. I mean, normally when you have things, school funding or things like that at the legislature, rural communities got lower cost of living in many cases, in some cases anyway, and therefore people get paid less perhaps and so on. But if you can't get enough a family practice doctor to practice in a small town where they need one, you may have to pay more to get them to go there, so you negotiate rates, and then generally you'd be negotiating it for a type of procedure, but the board has to take into account those things. The difference between what we have now, because all prices are negotiated somewhere or another right now, but we have 16 to 1 price disparities suggest nobody's negotiating or not negotiating in a rational way. Um, but yes, a clinic like Mayo Clinic, if they can show there's a reason for doing it, not because, oh, you're esteemed because we know you and you got all kinds of recognition, but if somebody's providing better care and they've got more difficult expertise, a specialist is going to get more pay than a general practitioner. But the disparities we have in this country now are two or three times as much sometimes. That's not a rational way to do it. So negotiating care is actually fair to the little guy, it's fair to the small clinic, it's fair to the small hospital. You're going to have a fair negotiated system, not based on negotiating clout of one industry against another. Um, Marty, can I piggyback on what you just said? In your book, you have a provision in your Minnesota health plan that provides fiscal incentives for those in rural areas, providing facilities and those who recently graduate from med school, you know, incentives to work there, right? That's the whole point. The board would be legally, the plan was built on 10 principles that I think any logical healthcare system has to, has to cover everyone, everything, has to give people a choice of providers, their choice of providers, not somebody else's network, um, has to make sure there are enough providers to serve the basic needs, which means they have to find a way to get enough providers in small communities, which, as I said, may mean paying more or paying off student debts or things like that. Yeah. Um, anyway, but that's okay. And Rose had something on it. I, I was just going to say, you know, it's the one industry in this country that is completely shrouded in secrecy. Yeah. Anybody in here know what the price of anything costs? In, in honesty. I mean, seriously, it has a price, right? It must have a price. What's a hip replacement? Well, depends. Are you in the metro area? Are you at HCMC? Or are you at, are you at United? Or Abbott Northwestern? Yeah. Right? Or are you at a Mayo Clinic? And then it's like, oh, well, wait a minute. I don't know. It costs one thing with Blue Cross, Blue Shield. It costs another thing with Medica. It costs another thing you know, with UCARE. It's like, what's the price? Anybody who studies some of this health policy stuff knows of a gentleman named Professor Uwe Reinhardt, who recently passed away, um, originally uh, from Germany, I believe he was, and um, brilliant from Princeton, um, health economist. And Uwe wrote a paper called It's the Price is Stupid. 
You know, when uh, you know, really based on what's driving costs, it's the prices. And, and I mean, when you look at this price variation, it's unbelievable. I mean, 10 years ago when I was in California, we looked at this, and there was a hospital, and I was in central, uh, the Central Valley of, of um, California, about 45 miles south of Sacramento. Well, in that area, you would get, you could get a, a coronary bypass surgery, and it would cost three times as much to have it done in one of those hospitals than it did 45 miles up the road in Sacramento, but you had a higher chance of actually not surviving it in those, they, they, they do the quality measure thing. So there wasn't even a correlation between, you know, sort of that capitalist idea that at least I'll pay more for something if it's a good product. It's craziness. We don't even know what the prices are. You use some level of global budgets for capital planning, right, for regional health planning, as, as um, Senator Marty had said. That immediately helps us get some level of cost containment within the system. Maryland is doing that as a state, and they absolutely are saving money just from implementing hospital global budgets. Can, can I add a... You should. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I want to come in. Um, <clears throat> there's a, um, one of my favorite statistics is comparing uh, U.S. spending uh, per capita and uh, the, the uh, spending uh, of our closest uh, peers in the, in the world, uh, the other G7 countries, uh, the UK, uh, France, Canada, Japan, and Italy, and I think I might have left one out, but anyway, there's uh, six others. Uh, we spend twice as much on average per person as they do, but they go to the doctor twice as often as we do. They're in the hospital twice as many days, and it's not because they're sicker. It's because they're, uh, you know, because it's because of the prices. Uh, there was a study that was done by, um, uh, let's see, I can't remember the, uh, Porter and, and uh, Posner and, and uh, David Cutler uh, that looked at Canada, and Canada has a, a situation where the government goes in and negotiates prices. And, the, and they go to negotiate prices, and so they're uniform across the whole country. There's a price schedule for everything uh, that's uniform across the country, and, and you have the, the government negotiating for everybody uh, against the uh, the providers, and, and so you have a system there where uh, uh, if, the, if that was imposed in the United States, uh, th these uh, these economists estimate that we'd have a 30 percent reduction in total cost just be, by getting those prices down and having you know, a negotiator, not like the insurance companies, the insurance companies negotiate, but they jack up, they keep their premiums high. Uh, if it's the uh, if it's the uh, government, they're going to lower the, the prices that are paid to uh, to the providers and uh, keep all the, the tax revenues uh, uh, commensurate with those. Okay. It's evident that the issue of health care is relevant to every citizen. However, the access to transparent information is tough. What is the best way that the public can become informed with this issue? in order to further the conversation. I, who should that go to? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, okay. I, I want to be sure I understand the transparency. Yep. It's evident that the issue of health care is relevant to every citizen. However, the access to transparency and information is tough. What is the best way that the public can become informed with this issue in order to further the conversation? Um, well, I, first of all, I would say that this is the number one issue when you go out and talk to people right now. Um, you know, we're in an election, election year in particular, right? And I'm telling you, everywhere we're going right now, people are saying their number one issue is still remains to be health care. People are worried about it for themselves, both from a, you know, mostly from a cost perspective, right, and from an access perspective for their families, for their loved ones, et cetera. Um, so I, you know, it, but and yet at the same time, 
we are a very busy society, right? And we have a lot going on. And for this many people to take a Friday night and come here to just talk about this and learn about it and ask questions and listen, and even if you don't buy into everything we're saying tonight, you know, you're, you're thinking about it. You're, you're interested in this issue and, and you're willing to take it to the next level. And that, that's what's key. It is, we are not going to win some kind of a humane healthcare system. Exactly what that looks like, you know, all of us have some ideas. Um, we just want it to be a health care system that gets people health care when they need it, right? Um, and in order to get that, it's going to take a movement. Uh, the people that are elected into office right now are not going to move without us saying to them, this is wrong, something's wrong, and it's your responsibility as an elected official to do something to fix it because this is in the public interest. And so if this is labor intensive. This is this kind of work, it's one-on-one, -on -one. it's talking to people. There are all kinds of resources, of course, the, in this day and age online, whether you use PNHP is an amazing resource for specific data. You know, if you're someone that really likes to look at data, um, go to PNHP's website, whether you use the Minnesota one, you can connect up to the national one, you will be blown away by the stuff that they've got there to answer all of your questions about this. Um, you know, I would offer that as important as the technical pieces to this issue are, at least from the nurse's perspective and from mine personally as well, this really is a moral question for us as a society. Who do we want to be as a society when it comes to this issue of making sure that we all have access to health care when we need it?�����������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������������
Would it improve education? Of course not. Take teacher time, administrator time, parent time away from teaching and helping kids with homework and stuff and into billing. And this, we don't want to do that, you but it so? makes no sense. And one health expert at General Mills said a few years ago, if you tried to design a health care system that didn't work, you couldn't have done a better job than we've done. <laughs> this one okay last question for tonight are there any proposed bills for Minnesota State or the US government to start the process of moving towards a single-payer system what action is being taken or needs to be taken for this to happen Marty I just I guess it's my bill so I better start with this one. <laughs> Um, in Minnesota, the Minnesota Health Plan, which is Senate File 219 and House File 358, we've been pushing it for almost 10 years now. Um, and um, I've got, I think I've got like 60 co-authors on the bill, which is a huge number of them. Um, it's a very huge push. I, I have to say that this would be the biggest political change in our society um, in my lifetime. Uh, and we've had huge other ones over the years, but this is one-sixth of our economy. And saying we're going to have a logical one-sixth of our economy is huge. But we're pushing on it. I'd say um, Healthcare for All Minnesota, the group in the back, and the nurses and PNHP yeah. um, are all advocating for it. And we're trying to educate. I mean, that's why I'm glad we come up here to Collegeville to be with you. And I think all of us do just because we care about it and think we can build a better system. So we're trying to build it. And when people say you can't make it happen, um, I use a couple of illustrations. One of which is um, uh, Max Baucus, who was the author of the Affordable Care Act. He was chair of the Senate Finance Committee 10 years ago. Um, he, would, he refused to hear a single payer bill in Washington. He said it wasn't going to happen. He wasn't going to hear it, wasn't going to consider it. A lot of doctors and nurses stood up in the hearing in a room like this and said, how come you won't consider a universal health care system, a single payer system? And he gaveled them out of order and they kept talking and so they had security guards haul them out. As soon as that person left the room, next one came, did the same thing. Anyway, Max, Max Baucus was credited as being the author of the Affordable Care Act by President Obama. Um, he gave an interview to newspapers in Montana uh, where he's from a couple of months ago saying he now thinks single payer is the way to go and he thinks we'll get there. It would have helped if he did it when he was in the U.S. Senate yeah. instead of retiring, but, but I think attitudes are changing and I think um, realistically we're running out of other options. There's there's also a national um, there's also a national bill HR 676 in the House which which was formerly sponsored by uh, Congressman Conyers and which uh, Congressman Ellison from Minneapolis is now the lead sponsor of and that has over 100 co-sponsors. HR HR 676, the expanded and improved Medicare for All Act. That's in the federal house. That's in the U.S. House. Yep. And in the U.S. Senate, there is S1804, uh, authored by Bernie Sanders. It ha um, that bill has 15 co-authors, first time in the history of the United States Senate, where there has been that uh, more than one <laughs> co-author uh, or author of a bill um, on this issue in the United States Senate. Um, the, the two bills are different, and um, they both need work, but they are certainly worthwhile as steps forward for us to use for organizing and to educate folks around this issue all right well and it's going to take all of us that's what it's going to take when we're fed up and we've had enough and we march on them and we tell them knock it off that's when it's going to make a difference yeah. <laughs> and I just would like to conclude with if the, if the politicians up in Washington say the single payer is not realistic, we should all exclaim BS. So I would now like to refer to Ann Jones, who is retired Air Force RN from Healthcare for All Minnesota. Thank you. Hi. Actually, I, I'm, uh, I was civilian nursing for over 45 years, and I was a reserve nurse for 23 years, so I had two jobs for a while, so um, a long while. 
And I've taken care of patients and families for over 45 years. I grew up right down the road on Highway 23 in a little town, 350 people. Um, I'm spending most of my post-working years working on educating and engaging the public on this issue, building a base of support with individuals and groups um, to demand change. And then we hope to work with the legislature to pass and implement a single care health care bill for Minnesota. And it, it, I'd love Minnesota to be first. So um, that's what we're about. We're working very closely with the for National Health Program, with Minnesota Nurses Association, with a lot of other organizations, labor, faith-based, um, and other issue, community action organizations to make, try to make this happen. But I believe this will come with demand from us, from voters. We are going to have to light the fire and um, stiffen the spines of some of these legislators. Senator Marty's leading the way, but he needs a lot more help than he's getting right now in the legislature. This is a very important election year. All the statewide offices are up for grabs, the entire House and our governor's uh, seat. And that's going to be pivotal to um, making some progress on this. We would love your, your contact information. We will not flood your mailbox. I promise we're all volunteers. You'd only get some from us about every couple weeks, and it would let you know what's going on everywhere. We're trying to you know, reach out and be a, more than a metro-centric organization. In fact, I'm traveling up to Mountain Iron, Minnesota, and Bemidji next week to give talks. So we really want to get out um, into um, our beautiful state. Um, I really highly encourage that you read this book. I've got four more copies. I've got some in my car. I do business out of my car, I say. <laughs> um, and, and it's online. Dr. Senator Marty would want me to tell you, you do not have to buy it. It's online. And it's a, it, this is Health Policy 101, and it gives you the sense that this is really possible and that there is a, a responsible transition plan in place to make it happen. Um, this is the Cliff Notes, wallet size. Um, this is uh, Healthcare Now, a national singer player organization, is having their na annual meeting in Minneapolis. I've got flyers in the back if you're interested in coming down. It's June 22nd to the 24th. They have high hopes for us. Um, this is a reading list. These are some of my favorites. Um, and, in, and, <laughs> and there's more. I could put six more. I ran out of room. Um, so you can read more about it. And there are a couple of websites. There are two things I'd really recommend. There's an, uh, a businessman out of Pennsylvania made a couple of videos because he's so um, committed to this. And the website is on this list and on this commitment to act form. I would um, love for everybody to pick up a commitment to act form and make a commitment to do two or three things on this list. Even if it's just to look at our website, you know, sign up, look at our website. We've got an activist toolkit on the website for things you can do to promote this issue. I say if you can give a Super Bowl party or a baby shower, you can have a book discussion on Senator Marty's book or show a video, the Fix It video, 40 minutes, you've got Health Policy 101. It's so clear when you watch it and then Big Pharma will, sh will tell you how we're being ripped off by the pharmaceutical company. But I won't say any more about that. So thank you all for coming tonight and um, I'll do the final back table. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I apologize to everybody whose questions we were not able to answer. We could be in here till midnight if we really wanted to, yeah. um, answering questions about this very engaging topic. So I would like to extend my deepest thanks to our panelists for contributing their time and expertise to further the discussion of a single payer system for Minnesota and the United States as a whole. Their experiences are invaluable as experience is the teacher of all knowledge. Will you join me in thanking them with your applause? Yeah. Uh, as you heard already, Dr. Jim Reed, a professor of political science here at uh, CSPSJU for over three decades and current DFL candidate, uh, was pertinent in the organization of this event, uh, specifically in reaching out to the panelists. So thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you. Uh, community activists Ann Jones, as you just heard from Carol and Ken Engelhart and Jane Conrad, were instrumental in the programming for tonight's event. Without them, thank you. 
Without them, the event would not have ran as smoothly as it did. And then uh, a very, very special thanks to Austin, as he was the moving force in creating tonight's event and as serving as our moderator. <laughs> There's a great article in the St. Cloud Times uh, a few days ago, if you didn't see it, featuring Austin. That was wonderful. Uh, additionally, staff and volunteers at the Eugene J. McCarthy Center assisted with coordination, advertisement, and countless other tasks to ensure the event ran as smoothly as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then finally, I would like to thank you all, the audience, for attending tonight's event. Knowing that your voice matters in the healthcare conversation is so critical. One of my favorite quotes from President Barack Obama encapsulates this mindset. One voice can change a room. And if one voice can change a room, then it can change a city. And if it can change a city, it can change a state. And if it changes a state, it can change a nation. And if it can change a nation, it can change the world. Your voice can change the world.